Well, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at Northern Kentucky University. And welcome to our 12th season of the Six at Six lecture series. The series is designed to uh, showcase research and uh, scholarship and creative work by NKU faculty and students. And I think we have a great season ahead for you. Um, so uh, the season is uh, now up uh, on our website and you can uh, RSVP, take a look at, see what interests you. I hope all the topics do. We have, uh, in addition to our uh, speaker this evening, four additional uh, faculty members who will be giving uh, talks and two guest lectures. Now, if you do the math, you'll see that six at six actually has seven lectures. So it's six plus one. Uh, so that uh, happens from time to time in our seasons. We, we add a, a few talks. Uh, on uh, The next one is October the 19th, uh, and that will be with James uh, uh, Jonathan Reynolds, who teaches in the uh, history department, and he's going to be looking at a uh, short history of distance. So if you think about how we've traveled over the years, uh, once we walked, then we rode horses, then we rode horses and saddles, and uh, next thing you know, we had chariots and then planes, trains, automobiles. So uh, our ability to, to uh, cover distance has changed the culture, and he'll take a look at that. So October the 19th, and once again on the 19th, as uh, will be true, this whole season will be hybrid. So you can join us in person or join us um, uh, by uh, 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 from the comfort of your home uh, in, a, in a virtual setting. Uh, we are tonight in the North Media studio with a small studio audience. Thank you all for coming. Uh, two of the lectures will be out in the community, which is our traditional pre-COVID way. Uh, one in the digitorium here at NKU in the College of Informatics and the other in the Mercantile Library in downtown Cincinnati. The Mercantile has been one of our community uh, partners since we started this uh, lecture series. So uh, 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 tell your friends, uh, check out the season. I think you'll uh, see that it's uh, going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be taking a look at a variety of the work uh, by NKU uh, faculty this season. So uh, tonight we have uh, uh, Dr. James uh, Walden, who is the director of the Center for Information Security, uh, and always a fun conversation in the hallway about what's going on in the uh, cybersecurity world. Uh, uh, and how we, uh, uh, um, I think uh, James once told me, I haven't been hacked yet by the Russians because I don't have enough money. Uh, his point was, we're all subject to this, uh, and uh, it uh, can be a little frightening, but things are less frightening when we understand them. So uh, tonight we're going to uh, take a, a, a deep dive into election security uh, and uh, uh, sort of look at uh, what uh, should we be worried about and what can we uh, maybe not worry about. So James, I'm going to turn it over to you. I do want to remind the audience, uh, uh, both in person and virtually, uh, questions are welcome at the end. In the audience, just raise your hand. And if you're virtual, uh, joining us virtually, uh, there's a question function at the bottom of, the, of your screen. Type the question in there and uh, we'll get your question to James when the time comes. So here we go. Thank you. Hello, I'm here to talk about the cybersecurity of uh, US elections, um, topic which is finally getting some of the attention uh, it deserves. Um, but we'll actually start a little bit earlier than that and look at, you know, why are we using computers for voting and should we be using them? Uh, so voting, um, of course, certainly dates back to ancient Greece, possibly also to ancient India. Um, in a um, a simplest way of voting is simply a voice vote, and even in early America, voice voting was still widely uh, used. Um, and we'll talk about what security properties that uh, violates um, when we start talking about how to secure elections. Uh, the ancient Greeks used ballots, which were uh, clay uh, stones. Um, there was a black uh, stone for a negative vote, a white stone for a positive vote. And so you can actually submit these relatively anonymously into a bag and then count them. Um, paper ballots uh, started by people bringing their own paper. Uh, but then parties realized that essentially it's sort of an advertisement and you know, to help people vote for their candidates, they could print uh, their own ballots and have uh, voters bring those to the polls. Of course, they wouldn't bother adding people from the other party to those ballots. <laughs> um, but there were some uh, controversy 
in uh, 1884 election with Grover Cleveland being elected president. And that led the US to look abroad to Australia where they had developed a standardized paper ballot, uh, which was marked in secret uh, so that people couldn't tell who you voted for. Um, and this is actually a uh, image of an early paper ballot. You see both parties are represented, but there were arguments about uh, how did you interpret a paper ballot? Uh, you know, are people supposed to put an X in it, or are they supposed to circle a name, underline a name, check marks? You know, what actually counted? What was the real voters' intention there? And what if they made multiple selections? That made it very difficult to identify a real intention of the voter. So people decided uh, in the mid 20th century it was time to use machines to solve this problem. And so uh, these uh, punch card machines had a lever where it would physically punch through the paper, except for those of us old enough to remember the 2000 election, remember the uh, hanging uh, chads and jammed uh, paper uh, chad receptacles that you see in the image here. And that's actually what led to uh, the large scale introduction of computers for voting. It was after the 2000 election. There were a lot of disputes about how to count uh, hanging chads, pregnant chads, and uh, various other things. So it turned out the mechanical machines weren't as precise as they had been advertised to be. And so we decided to quickly move to electronic machines without spending a lot of time thinking about whether they would really offer this precision. Of course, vendors said they would. Um, so there's three main security aspects that we can really look at for any cybersecurity problem. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality is about keeping information private, uh, keeping things like you know, credit card numbers and passwords secret. Integrity is about preventing the unauthorized alteration of information. Uh, so if you've been unlucky enough to be affected by ransomware, the attacker encrypts your data and then thus modifying it and then charges you for access to it. Although actually ransomware hits on the third aspect as well, availability the ability to access your information in a timely fashion. So the uh, ransomware attacker uses an integrity attack to achieve an availability attack so they can extort money from you. In terms of elections, confidentiality refers to keeping ballots secret and thus preventing people from being coerced to vote in certain ways. If the ballot is truly secret, you can't prove how you voted. Um, as far as integrity, voters want to know that their ballots are cast as intended and were actually counted, and that the final tally of everyone's ballots is accurate. For availability, voters should be able to vote when they reach the polling place. Note that this essentially means that internet voting is impossible, because it is impossible to ensure the availability of internet systems. Uh, denial of service attacks over the network where attackers recruit millions of computers across the world to send network packets as fast as they can to a target website to shut that website down. Uh, this is often used as part of an extortion scam. Uh, we see it a lot on like online gambling sites. We also see it in gaming uh, where people run uh, servers and so people try to shut down those servers like well you're making so many thousand a day for the server the criminal wants a chunk of your proceeds and because those attacks come from such a wide diversity of machines across the world you, you can't just block the attack at a specific location uh, to sustain a denial of service attack you need to have more resources than the criminal can have and if you're Google or Amazon, you can do that most of the time. But state um, election systems don't have those kinds of resources. Also, they have a much worse problem. 
uh, because elections occur on one day a year, maybe a few extra days if you have primaries and early voting and such, but it's a very limited time frame. And so if the attacker can prevent voting during a very short time frame with a dial service attack, uh, they may you know, prevent the election from happening effectively. And so there's really no good defense against that. You could say, well, you know, we'll transfer our infrastructure into like Google or Amazon's cloud, uh, but the time it would take you to move that is often measured in days or weeks. It's expensive to keep that all the time. Uh, so there's really no good solution to that. Um, and that ignores all of the manifold other confidentiality and integrity issues internet voting would bring up. So please never do that. Any voting uh, expert will tell you the same thing. Um, it's important to look at the economics of cybersecurity. Both attackers and defenders have limited resources and thus will try to invest those resources as effectively as possible. Attackers have a much easier job than defenders. The attacker needs to find one way to get in. The defender must defend every possible way to get into a system. So attackers will go after the weakest link, the easiest one place to get into a system. Uh, they will choose attacks that have the biggest impact for the effort required. And so an attack that can flip thousands of votes is much more attractive than an attack that affects just a few votes. Finally, they will choose an attack that imposes the lowest risk. So they will prefer to attack over the internet, uh, possibly from a country that doesn't have extradition to the US, and uh, to, as opposed to going to the polls, <coughs> excuse me, and committing voting fraud in person where you can be arrested and jailed for committing a felony. Um, so uh, CISA, uh, the government agency that's responsible for securing the federal government and also uh, works to secure elections, has produced this nice uh, sort of timeline indicating all of the aspects of elections from uh, registration uh, here at the top, through uh, transferring the registration database to poll books to be used in individual polling places, to interacting with the voting machines, to tabulating the votes, and finally re reporting the vote total. So the attacker is going to pick the weakest link in this chain, um, also subject to having a link that affects the most people and has the lowest risk. So let's start with voter registration systems. Uh, these are attractive targets um, because they have a lot of connectivity, as you can see in this diagram here. Uh, for example, we have motor voter laws. That means the DMV is connected to your voter registration database. So that's a potential way for attackers to get into your voter registration database. They can hack the DMV and then pivot from there into the registration system. It's also attached to things like the Bureau of Vital Statistics so that people are removed from voter rolls when they die and such. Um, and a variety of other systems. So the voter registration system is connected to the internet, unlike voting machines, which normally are not. And so it's always subject to attack. And there's also a limited number of them. And that's also very attractive. So as opposed to going after, you know, millions of voting machines, hundreds of millions of voters, you can go after a few dozen voter registration systems in each state. Um, and you can make large scale changes there. If you gain uh, right access to the database, you can remove people, add people, uh, and so forth. Now, there are provisional ballots, so if you think you should be able to vote, you can do a provisional ballot, but there are limited numbers of those, so if you do a large scale attack, people will, uh, polling places will run out of those, so people won't be able to complete them, and they're not always uh, counted if you run out of time uh, and such to do the counting. 
So um, let's look at the uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability impacts of attacks on voter registration systems. So for confidentiality, attackers gain access to private data. Um, that data uh, can be used for a variety of purposes, often just resold to other uh, hackers. Uh, you can also threaten to publish it and ask for a ransom from the state to not publish it. Uh, for integrity violations, these are probably the biggest worry uh, because this is where you can modify, um, delete, add, and make other changes to people on the voting rolls. And for availability, if you could stop access to voter registration systems, you can prevent people from registering to vote. You can prevent uh, registration records from being transferred to poll books. So you can prevent uh, essentially the election from uh, working if you can hold a denial of service attack for long enough at the right time of year. And we have seen these attacked as we would expect since they are an easily attacked attractive target. Uh, well, this news story did mention 21 states. Eventually, the investigation expanded and they found Russian attackers had targeted every state's voting systems. Um, and in a couple of states, they did find the attackers did have the ability to make modifications to the database. Uh, they did say that they found no modifications to the database. It's not always as strong a claim as you might hope. Uh, it doesn't mean there weren't any, it just means they didn't find any. And that probably does limit the scale of the changes. You know, if you remove 10,000 voters, that would probably leave a big trail on a voting day that, that it actually happened. Uh, but small changes might be easy enough to do. Um, and, uh, oh, and there was also an American hacker who uh, removed uh, the governor of Florida's uh, registration record from Florida's voting registration system. Uh, now, of course, being the governor, he was able to successfully file a provisional ballot and vote. Um, but if you want to target a particular person, um, probably most people aren't uh, the governor of the state. Um, also, states do their own voting purges uh, in an attempt to remove uh, people who um, shouldn't vote because they no longer live in the state, they're deceased, um, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these voter purges have very poor matching criteria, um, often intentionally, because uh, we know in 2000 that there were three vendors that bid to do the voter purge uh, before the 2000 election. The state of Florida picked the most expensive bid that offered the worst match. Um, and so um, we've seen a lot of voter purges that remove people who should not have been removed by the state law and criteria. Um, they've often pointed at software errors for being at fault there. But we have seen uh, people doing that fairly um, actively too. And uh, also when the Supreme Court um, removed the plea clearance uh, aspects of the Voting Rights Act, uh, states that have been subject to those restrictions dramatically increased the size of their voting purges after that. Uh, this is what Florida did in 2000. They matched 80% of the name, um, the birth date within one digit, any one digit could be wrong, um, and um, so you can see these two names are definitely not the same person. We've got John Fitzgerald and Johnny Fred, and uh, but if one of those triggered a rule to remove them, say he committed a felony, everybody within that 80% of the name and other criteria would be removed from the voting rolls and were. Uh, estimates were about 60,000 people were removed from Florida's voter rolls that year who uh, should not have been removed. 
So poll books are our next step. So uh, poll books are filled with data from uh, the registration database. They are typically electronic today, uh, not paper any longer. And um, they um, have a list for everybody who should vote in a particular precinct. And of course, the poll workers check the signature to ver against the signature in uh, the electronic poll book to verify that you should have access. Um, but there are some worries here. Uh, one is also signature data is something an attacker could have altered in the registration database. That's something that's not quite as visible as actually deleting people. Um, and electronic poll books have a lot of the usual vulnerabilities of computers. Right? Um, and especially if they're networked, uh, that gives you additional avenues to attack them. They should not be on voting day um, attached to the internet as that would allow attacks from anywhere in the world. Um, but they should be networked to each other so that somebody can't, you know, vote twice by going to a different computer. Uh, they all should have the same uh, database and, um, that they use to decide who can vote and who can't. Uh, from the attacker perspective, you can affect multiple voters by attacking them. Uh, but it's a much smaller number than you can affect by targeting the registration database. There's a lot more of these devices to target, um, and they may be different software and hardware implementations, which require uh, different types of attacks to be successful on them. And if they're truly not on the internet, uh, that means attacking them requires someone to be there roughly in person. You can log into a wireless network with a special antenna from a couple miles away. Uh, so you don't have to be right there in the polling place, but uh, you do have to be in the country. You can't do this from uh, across the world. Uh, so um, our three uh, aspects of security, the impacts are pretty similar to that of registration databases, but affecting a smaller number of people. So again, you can expose private registration data. Uh, attackers can modify registration data, and they can uh, eliminate availability, thus preventing voting from happening at a particular polling place unless they happen to have a paper backup. Now we go on to the uh, fun part, the voting machines. And uh, unfortunately, this cartoon basically tells you uh, what any person in software engineering or computer security would tell you about voting systems. If you go talk to an, an aerospace engineer, they will tell you about how safe it is to fly and such. If you talk to someone in cybersecurity, they will tell you how completely unsafe it is to vote using electronic machines. Um, that said, don't get too scared in this section. There is a solution. Um, so what are the impacts here uh, if you can attack a voting machine? So one is confidentiality. In this case, you can see how somebody voted. You don't have their personal information, but you do have records of how they voted. As far as integrity, um, what you print on the screen can be completely different from what you record on whatever medium, usually a, a flash drive attached to a USB port. Um, and that's pretty similar. Actually, when I'm looking at the computer here, I'm seeing presentation view. I'm not seeing the slot, slide that you're seeing. I'm seeing a bunch of extra data. Um, so same program, but it's giving two different views of what's happening. And for availability, you could prevent people from voting on that particular machine. So this is an even smaller number of people than you would impact by attacking a poll book, which is still smaller than attacking a registration system. So voting fraud is extremely uh, rare. Um, penalties are severe. Uh, the risk is high because you do have to do this in person. Uh, there have been a fair number of audits done over this, and uh, they 
tend to find the numbers are very small, too small to affect elections other than, say, like a small town city council or something where there's, you know, 100 or less people voting. Um, and really, if you want to affect the outcome of, of an election, you know, this is not where an attacker is going to invest. Um, so why all the hullabaloo about voter ID laws? I think in part because um, this is probably the easiest attack for someone who doesn't know anything about cybersecurity to understand. And we do occasionally see people try it. You know, every election, you know, you'll see, you know, usually it's not more than a dozen or two people across the nation in a presidential election who get caught trying to do this. I think the funniest one in 2020 um, was when uh, the governor's son, who was 17 years old, I think it was in Virginia or North Carolina, um, tried to vote for, for his father um, uh, there when he was a candidate and went to several different polling places. Um, I don't recommend trying to do that if you're not a governor's son again. Um, uh, so there have been some long term studies. And again, yeah, they sort of find, you know, a few dozen ineligible people uh, register um, successfully, but most of those don't vote. Um, and of course, people who aren't uh, citizens uh, who are felons can get voter IDs. So it doesn't really prevent uh, those uh, people from attempting to vote. And actually, through the history of the, the US, um, uh, over the years, we've sort of gone back and forth on whether you had to be a citizen to vote or not, uh, whether being a felon matters depends on which state you're in and so forth. Um, really, given the political behavior, the real purpose of voter ID laws are to control who votes. Um, immediately after uh, the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act were struck down, uh, within 24 hours, there were bills in multiple states uh, that have been subject to preclearance imposing voter ID laws that they knew would have be prevented by courts before that point. Um, and also, when you look at the specific uh, IDs that are allowed, you very much notice the party pushing the voting uh, ID bill likes IDs that their voting population is likely to have and dislikes other types of IDs. And furthermore, we saw some states like Alabama, uh, who after, again, the preclearance was removed, they added voter ID laws, and then they proceeded to close DMVs where people would get those IDs. So why are we trying to do electronic voting at all? Um, largely because of the problems in the 2000 election in Florida led to the passing of the Help America Vote Act, HAVA. And um, it provided one-time funding for new voting machines, and it had no security requirements at all. No one really thought about that at the time. Um, or at least the people who did think about it in the cybersecurity community weren't consulted <laughs> by Congress when this happened. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, obviously, having no security requirements is bad. Um, and the one-time funding is also a problem. So computers work best when they are on 24 by 7 in a climate-controlled environment. Uh, but voting machines, you pull out once or twice a year for a few days. Uh, so this isn't good for long-term hardware life. And also, what are all the precincts going to do when their voting machines are too old to use? Um, either because the hardware is failing or because there are no longer security updates. So um, voting machines are PCs, as we'll talk about. And you know, if you're running a modern OS like Windows 10 or Windows 11, Microsoft makes security updates. And we'll deliver those to you. If you use Windows 7 or 8, they don't do that anymore. And so a lot of places have old, old voting machines where you literally can't get security updates for them. Uh, there's several different types of uh, electronic voting machines. There's the optical scan, 
where they mark a paper ballot, which can be then counted by an optical scanning machine. Uh, there are ballot marking devices, um, which are, are similar to the optical scan, but instead of printing a computer readed, uh, readable ballot, they print a humanly readable ballot. Although some of them do both, which is somewhat problematic, as we'll see. And then there's what most of the voting machines purchased after HAVA was passed, uh, were the direct recording electronic, where they record the vote directly to a, a computer storage device like a flash memory drive. Uh, these are particularly bad because you can't do a recount. The software has a recount function, but all it does is it rereads the flash memory totals. It doesn't count anything. It just says, oh, the total was, was this, and it, you know, it's going to print that again. The total still this. <laughs> So voting machines are just PCs, um, almost all of them running Windows. Every year, Microsoft patches well over a thousand vulnerabilities. So every uh, second Tuesday in the security profession, we call this Patch Tuesday, you get security updates if you're running Windows of a version that still has updates for it, like 10 or 11. Um, now, of course, this might suggest a problem uh, didn't I say the voting machines weren't on the internet? So how do they get their updates? So um, to do this securely, uh, there are companies that specialize this and states uh, contract with these companies. And what they do is they do put a server on the internet. It collects the security updates from Microsoft and from like the voting machine vendor and, and, and for any other software that might be on the system. And then they take that machine off the internet and they put that on an isolated network that is not internet connected. They hook the voting machines up to that isolated network and then they pick up updates from that server. Um, it's not a perfect process, but it's certainly better than putting them directly on the internet. Uh, potentials for attack are if you can attack that machine while it's on the internet, uh, and put a piece of malware on it, like a worm that spreads over the network, it will carry that worm over to that isolated network and spread it to all the voting machines. Uh, so you do have to be very careful when it picks up its updates. Also, uh, those vendors often contract with multiple states. So uh, this is a attractive um, area to attack voting machines. Attacking them one by one in person is high risk, low reward, uh, but attacking uh, them when you get multiple states voting machines hooked up to that isolated network is a little, much more attractive. And, um, you know, fraud can be invisible. You know, the computer doesn't have to print on the screen uh, what it actually stores electronically. And some ballot marking devices produce both a human readable ballot and a barcode or QR code for machine reading. That is faster to count. Uh, machines count those much faster. But how do you know that the humanly read readable ballot corresponds to the uh, QR code? And you don't. <laughs> uh, so it's really important to have those not create any special computer readable things. So you ha can have that discrepancy between what the system counts versus what the human thinks uh, is counted. Um, and you might think, well, you know, let's just make better voting machine software and uh, improve Windows and such. Microsoft patches that many vulnerabilities every year. Um, Microsoft's current secure software engineering development processes are state of the art, as good as anyone's. But they also have a mountain of legacy code dating back to, you know, the first version of Windows and first versions of Office and such. And trying to remove all those vulnerabilities is part of what leads to this count always being so high. Um, so you really can't get perfect software. Um, and you can actually mathematically prove that, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, so there is real no, no perfect solution. There are much better solutions where you could create a dedicated operating system and dedicated software with a security first mindset. 
Um, and you can actually create specific software. You can mathematically prove that that particular piece of software uh, follows, you know, the security standards that you wrote down before you developed it. Uh, but that kind of development is very expensive and also very slow. And really, states don't have the kind of money to purchase that sort of software. There isn't a market for it, uh, at least for voting machines. Fortunately, we do see that sort of software development in things like aircraft systems and such. They you know, are willing to invest in that, and I'm happy they are. Uh, but for most off-the-shelf software using common things like Windows, you're going to have a lot of security vulnerabilities. You're going to have new ones reported every month and have to have some way of managing those. Um, DEF CON is the annual hackers conference in Las Vegas. And uh, they have what they call our villages where they get a bunch of things to hack. Uh, so there's like a lock picking village. Uh, there's a, a healthcare device village with you know insulin pumps and pacemakers and the like. And people during the conference, you know, can just sit there 24 by 7 hacking as opposed to going to the conference sessions. And so they've done that since 2017 with voting devices, including registration systems, electronic poll books, and the actual balloting machines. Uh, every year they hack every device they get. They have 100% success rate. And they have like 13 year old kids hacking them because like, oh yeah, I just had to look up what the default password was and it let me in. Uh, to, to the device, or hey, there was a report of a bug from 20, 2003, and they hadn't fixed it in, in, in the software in 2017 yet. Uh, so um, hacking voting devices, unfortunately, is very easy. So you're probably in the bad feeling part of this yet, but there are there's some good news to add. Uh, one of the parts of good news is that American voting systems are highly diverse. So if you're writing a spreadable piece of malware, you really need to be attacking the same software everywhere. But um, America chooses voting machines. Some states do it on a state level. You can look up in the Northwest, you see like Oregon and Washington do it at a state level. But you notice a lot of states have mixed colors where it's done by a county level. So there are literally um, you know, hundreds of different types of voting machines and software of different versions and such. So if you want to try to hack the whole, you know, a, a global US election like a presidential election, then uh, you're going to have to invest a huge amount of effort understanding lots of different types of voting systems. Um, let me actually skip that, sorry. Um, um, ballot marking devices are becoming more common, and, and these are a hopeful thing because we're trying to get around the idea that we record how you vote electronically in a way that humans can't read it. And instead, we record things on paper so you can actually see who I voted for on the screen is really who's going to be counted that I voted for. Uh, so that's called a voter verified paper audit trail, a VVPAT. Um, and ballot marking devices, uh, the plus is that, that, that they do do that. The minus is that some of them do include QR codes and such. And if the machine's counting the QR code, you don't know who you, who you voted for anymore, actually. Um, Mail-in ballots uh, were widely used in 2020 because of coronavirus, although some states like Oregon have used these for a long time. Um, and really, we didn't really find many big problems with them. Again, it's paper. That's always going to be a more secure technology than computers. Uh, invisible fraud is harder in paper. Uh, not impossible, certainly, but um, you can have some hope that you can tell who you voted for. Uh, there were some attempts to get rid of um, absentee ballots. There were some problems with uh, different counties and producing enough of them or printing them correctly. Um, and of course, there's things like the infamous butterfly ballot from Florida in 2000, where it was very hard to figure out who you were voting for. Um, of course, errors can also occur on the computer displays as well. Um, so that's not a purely uh, paper ballot problem. 
Uh, we did see a few cases where people uh, stole their spouse's ballot and filled that in, or an elderly parent's ballot and filled that in uh, while not being them. But again, you know, that's a very low impact thing. You change one uh, uh, vote. So the solution to uh, computers is paper and having an audit process to actually be able to uh, check that paper. And so there's a statistical procedure called a risk limiting audit, where you take a sample of the paper ballots, uh, count them, and then perform a hypothesis test, uh, which the same type of thing that scientists do when trying to determine the outcome of an experiment. And um, the law would specify, you know, we want, say, a 99% chance uh, of the uh, test being um, correct, or 95% or whatever the state has decided to do. And so you perform the hypothesis test, and it would either say, yes, uh, we conclude that the total count is correct based on our sample and our test within that 99% accuracy, or you would say, we can't conclude that from the sample. And so the risk of audit procedure then is to say, get a bigger sample, repeat the count, perform the, the test on the larger sample. And if you keep getting inconclusive, you keep getting larger samples until you eventually do a total recount. Um, so it gives you a way to economically uh, verify elections without always having to do a full hand re re recount. And the procedure either always gives you an answer within your desired accuracy or uh, you recount the whole thing. Uh, not all states do that. Um, those are a variety of states that, that are trying that. It is becoming more popular. So what about tabulation in general? Um, the cartoon is uh, Bosch Tweed, and I know it can be a little hard, hard to uh, uh, read, so I'll read the uh, text below. It's like, what are you going to do about it if I'm the one who counts the votes? Doesn't really matter who you vote for if you can compromise the tabulation process. So um, confidentiality, not as much of a worry here um, it basically allow attackers to expose the current vote total. And that could be used to um, uh, prevent people from voting or well, to discourage people from voting. Um, I, I remember when I was a kid during um, uh, the, the election where uh, Reagan became pre president, where uh, there was a lot of hullabaloo in the media because they were reporting East Coast results. You know, Reagan has won before West Coast voters had voted. Uh, today, that seems a little archaic. We're so used to that. Uh, but, you know, discouraging voters is a possible way to alter election outcomes. Um, integrity. Attackers can change the totals. Uh, this is obviously uh, probably the worst outcome uh, you could have there. And availability, they could prevent tabulation from happening in a timely fashion. Um, if you do have a paper trail, you could do a hand count, but that does take longer. And it is important to remember that there are legal deadlines for elections, as we became pretty aware of with the 2020 election, that you know states had to certify uh, their votes uh, for the president by a certain date. If you can't do a recount by that date, you might not be able to include your state's electoral votes in that election. So an availability attack can be quite serious. Um, and also, um, there are issues on how you count ballots. And computers do help with this a little bit by preventing you from doing some of these things. These are actual ballots. Uh, that were published by a Minnesota pa paper where they were attempting to uh, do a recount. And yeah, it's sort of like, you know, how would you decide who this person voted for a senator? It's like, well, you know, they filled in the oval there, but then they filled in a square outside of the area for the other party's candidate. And then they have these partial marks. And so, 
that one's pretty, you know, there's no real good way to discern the voter intent there. Um, others, it's like, well, the big X is like, well, does that mean they just didn't vote for those? And maybe we should count the rest of their uh, ballot. Um, historically, with paper ballots, uh, one way that counters would alter the total, they would keep pencil leads under their fingernails and they would add stray marks to the paper ballots and then toss them out. Uh, because they had um, marks that weren't allowed, because if extra marks could be used to uh, attest to like, yes, this is my ballot, I did vote for who you told me to, um, so they do allow for coercion, and so that's why they were disallowed. Um, the nice thing about a computer printing one is that you probably have less of this. Of course, printers run out of ink, have jams, you know, there are problems there too. Uh, tabulators are PCs, just like the voting machines and uh, electronic poll books, um, and they are often network accessible, uh, including via faxes. Some states still do use faxes for this type of things. Attacks have a, have a higher impact than on voting machines. Um, and, you know, in many ways, these are probably as attractive and a, a target as voter registration systems are for attackers. Um, they can be used to create doubt about results. Um, so like denial of service attacks have been used in the past, like in Knox County in 2018. Um, and really here again, the risk limiting audit is, is our security mechanism here so that we have some way to validate the account. So even if the software has been compromised, we can use a risk limiting audit to detect that and we can eventually do a hand recount to get an official tally. So let's see how election cybersecurity has changed. And this is where the good news is. It's improved a lot since HAVA first came out. Uh, in that era, pretty much everything was the direct recording electronic machines. There was no paper trail, so you couldn't do audits or check the software. You just had to trust all of the software. Um, the uh, federal government established uh, CISA under the Department of Homeland Security. They're an agency responsible for not just securing federal uh, computer systems and networks, but also working with the states, uh, protecting critical infrastructure like utilities and the like. Um, and they provide a lot of election security resources and uh, argue very convincingly that 2020 was our best election so far in terms of cybersecurity. Um, and uh, those resources include not just documentation, they provide tools to assess risk, um, and uh, they actually perform cybersecurity assessments so they can actually assess a state or county's election systems. Um, there are the voluntary voting system guidelines, and these were released a little bit after HAVA, when people realized, oh wait, we probably should worry about cybersecurity. Um, and although they are voluntary, 38 states do require version one of the standard in their state law. So they're pretty widespread in use. Unfortunately, version 1.0 is extremely weak. It's better than nothing. Um, and so they tried to update in 1.1. It's a really slow process. Uh, voting machine vendors don't want you to, you to say that no, states can no longer use your voting machines. And also states don't want you saying that either because like, where are we gonna get the money to get new voting machines that meet the new security standards? Uh, so pretty much everyone ignored version 1.1 and it took six years to uh, actually finally be accepted. Um, Version 2.0 looks a lot better. It's a significant overhaul. Software and hardware has changed a lot since 2005. Um, one of the scariest things I, I've sort of discovered with modern computers is like, wait, why are there wireless internet in my desktop? It's a desktop. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, those are the same types of hardware that are adopted to be using voting machines. Um, and so there's been a big debate in, uh, around the 2.0 standards about 
does a wireless hardware device count if it's disabled? Uh, because you, you can't have wireless access and meet these standards. And uh, I think uh, we've largely gone with counting it if it's disabled, which I, I'm not terribly happy about, but because uh, after all, it was disabled, can be re-enabled. And um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second there. Um, um, so wireless access is dangerous, but the problem is, is that since they do use off the shelf hardware, they're finding it very difficult to buy hardware that doesn't have uh, a wireless interface on the computer motherboard. I sort of miss the uh, physical access points. If, if you decide you uh, don't like an ethernet port going into your computer, you get an epoxy gun and you can close that thing and nobody's gonna use it after that. Really hard to do that with wireless. I mean, you, you can put it in a metal Faraday cage, uh, but again, uh, the expense issue really uh, hits you there. Uh, so the 2.0 standard is a lot better. It is uh, the final draft or semi-final draft is, has been released this year. Uh, and they're also creating a uh, accredited lab program. Previously, pretty much anyone could say, hey, I, I'm a BVSG lab, and yes, this uh, voting machine looks great. Uh, so now they're creating a standard for the uh, labs that, um, to verify that the machines meet the standards. And uh, they are allowing an upgrade path so that if you update your software, possibly and or hardware, uh, that older voting machines could be certified under the 2.0 standard. Um, again, this isn't perfect, uh, but this will be a big improvement, uh, but it doesn't obviate the need to keep risk limiting audits around along with a voter verified paper audit trail. Um, since we're in Kentucky, let's talk about Kentucky's laws. Um, Kentucky uh, signed uh, this law in 2021, and they do require a voter verified paper audit trail by the end of this year. Um, and they also say they must meet the uh, voluntary voting system guidelines as amended. Previously, it said 1.0, but now basically they, that'll point us to using the current version of the standard, which is important. It also established a pilot program to do risk limiting audits um, for the counties that have the uh, paper audit trails. And we can see a huge improvement in Kentucky from uh, 2006 is the earliest year I could get statistics uh, for what type of voting machines are used. Uh, note all but one county used uh, machines without a paper audit trail in 2006. So there was really no way to verify election outcomes at that point. Um, however, today, most, um, well, basically every county by the end of this year, actually by the November election, will be using machines that offer a paper audit trail. They just use different types of them, which is why counties have different uh, colors there. Ohio is not so dramatic. Um, they have improved uh, systems, but they uh, never had the preponderance, uh, at least not as far back as 2006, a preponderance of machines without paper audit trails. Unfortunately, I don't have data from the uh, first election after HAVA to see what they had then. But again, you probably don't purchase voting, on, voting machines every couple of years because they're expensive. So it's probably quite similar to the 2006. Uh, map I have here. Uh, so let's look at future threats. Um, I was actually sort of surprised not to see denial of service attacks in 2020 because they're so easy to do. This diagram is an ad on a stress testing site as uh, denial of service uh, hackers call their services to make them seem quasi legal. Um, this site was actually run by a couple of uh, teenagers, and they made millions of dollars uh, doing denial of service attacks for hire before they were caught. Uh, so, um, and note those prices are really cheap. You want to, uh, they're usually hourly prices if you want to take someone off the internet. 
Um, the price goes up, the, the better their internet connection is. Uh, but if you want to knock, you know, an organization with a few servers and such, which unfortunately often describe state um, election systems, you don't really have to pay much per hour to take them out. Um, how can they charge so little? Um, economies of scale. They hack uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of machines across the world. And when I say computer, you tend to see something like the laptop I have in front of me. But remember, your home router is a computer. And how many of you out there in the audience have updated your home router's uh, security updates um, in the last month? Probably just me. No. Nope. I see someone in the studio who has two. That's, that's twice the size as I thought it would be. Um, um, increasingly, um, they are offering auto updates and such for those, but a lot of these botnets, uh, which are what all these collections of compromised computers are called, are often things like home routers, closed circuit TV cameras, things you don't think of as, as computers and often aren't secured as computers need to be. So they're relatively easy to hack. And since you're not paying for the computing resources, all the people who own those computers are paying, you know, their own ISP for their network connection, is a cheap service to offer. Um, the other thing I, I'm sort of surprised that we hadn't seen ransomware, because um, ransomware gangs, you know, initially had some standards they wouldn't attack hospitals and such, but now I see every week in the security news, you know, multiple hospitals have been hit by ransomware and have closed down. Usually, Usually it's a particular department. It's fair, relatively rare they take down a whole hospital. Um, and there's also fake ransomware. So Petya was a, a fairly widespread uh, ransomware, but um, it was later discovered that there was a sequel to Petya, which we, we call not Petya because it looks like Petya. It presents a ransomware demand but it just deleted everything on the system so your computer will no longer boot and uh, russian hackers actually created not pet yet to attack uh, the, the ukraine back in like 2014. Uh, they've waged sort of a constant cyber war uh, after the incident in the crimea in 2014 against the ukraine and this is one of the ways they uh, did it it, it managed to wipe out a, a swedish shipping company a large multi-billion dollar one there were lines going to ports um you know miles long of semis and they had no idea what was on these big container ships because all computer records have been deleted so like we have all these containers we have no idea what's in any of them until a human inspects them um they're actually still in a battle with, with their cyber insurance company who claims that was an act of war and it's refusing to pay out the 100 million plus they're asking for from them um and yeah, so certainly it doesn't take a lot of skill to create something like NotPetya. And so I was a little surprised that we haven't seen more of that uh, out there. We've certainly seen, it, you know, cyber war is definitely happening. Iran has used uh, this type of wiper malware on Saudi oil fields and the like. So it's out there. It happens every year. It just hasn't been used on elections yet. Uh, so what do we need to do to have secure voting? One is we need adequate resources. We need enough voting machines uh, so that people can vote in a reasonable amount of time and resources to handle a little bit extra in case there are denial of service attacks. Uh, we need to ensure there's always a humanly readable paper ballot and that that is what is used to do the count because it is literally you know, impossible to trust computers that way. Um, and we need risk limiting audits so we can use those paper ballots to verify that the computer results are accurate. Um, and while it's great that Kentucky is doing all of these things that, that, that are mentioned there, but really we need to see this happen on a nationwide level. And we need to see Congress doing this and providing the resources uh, necessary to uh, meet these requirements. They're not really that complicated. Um, and hopefully I've explained them in a way that makes them understandable as well. Uh, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, do you have any questions? Any questions in the 
studio audience, just um, Angel, let me ask you this. You uh, showed um, some uh, uh, state uh, information in Kentucky, uh, that Kentucky's a new law, but is there a state that's a kind of a best practice state right now? And where does Kentucky sort of rank, if you happen to know? Um, yeah, yeah, there actually is, is a uh, website that ranks all the states with uh, A through F grades. Um, and uh, Kentucky in 2018 was a D, uh, but uh, really as of 2022, we meet all the standards to be an A on, on that list. Um, I think California was, was, was an A, uh, Massachusetts as well. Um, so, so, so yeah, there are some model states out there that have done what's, what's needed to do and what Kentucky is you know, doing now. Just to remind the virtual audience, if you have a question, put it in the question, uh, uh, click on the questions at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll uh, uh, ask your question. We do have one question from the uh, virtual audience asking if you've had an opportunity to make your recommendations uh, to any uh, public officials, either at the state or federal level. Um, I haven't, no. <laughs> no. Would, would you like to have that? <laughs> Okay, if there's any public officials uh, listening, uh, uh, James is ready to uh, to help you. I'm curious. Uh, uh, you do a lot of uh, you know, teaching and research in cybersecurity. Uh, what brought you uh, to be interested in um, voting? And is that something that uh, is just a particular interest of yours, or is that really a hot topic in the cybersecurity field? Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my, my work is in secure software engineering. So how, how do you develop uh, secure software, including voting machine software, but also you know, all of the other software we, we use. Uh, but it was really the, the um, 2000 um, election, well, and, and probably really have a, as a result of it, where we suddenly went from having mostly mechanical or paper uh, voting systems and suddenly jumped head first into uh, computerized voting systems uh, without really any thought of cybersecurity uh, being brought into that. Um, I have a question. Yes, please. It's about, it's sort of a connected question about purges and matching signatures. I still don't understand what signature exactly signatures are being matched to. Because nobody signs their name in any legible way anymore. So, what exactly are they matching to, to in order to do the purge? And then, related to that is, why do the purge anyway? I understand that that there is a cost associated with every record that you keep, but it's electronic. So, I'm thinking the cost is pretty small for each record you keep. So, why purge? Anybody other than they died or they moved? Yeah, certainly given the storage capacity of modern computers, yeah, there's no record cost really as, you know, well below a cent yeah. uh, to uh, do that. Um, the purges don't actually involve si 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 signatures. That's a separate security mechanism and um, uh, asset again if I forget to uh, come back to it. Um, <clears throat> The key thing about, about the purchase is, is that states don't really have another way of determining who's currently living in the state. Um, they, they, they don't have a record from when people leave the state and such. Um, and because the US is, has such a federal system, we don't have a national system of tracking that like most c countries do, uh, where you would have a national national database would tell you where everyone lived and it would be fairly easy. So we have these individual state databases. There are some uh, companies that try to track that. And so states get, request them for information to do the purging, to try to remove the excess voter rolls. Uh, they do also want, want to remove uh, dead people because at least I always heard my parents talk about, you know, in 1960s in Chicago, all these dead people voted. Um, <laughs> um, that's pretty easy to do, to yeah. match yeah, it, the death records and, and it gets done. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, we don't have a single uh, standard ID. The Social Security number is close as we have for that. Um, and uh, But I don't think all states record that for their voter registration databases. And so matching is sort of necessarily imperfect. Um, so then what? Yeah. 
how did the poll watchers get those pages and pages of names that they were looking at as people were registering to vote in the primary this year? Where did that come from? Um, I don't know actually where they got that data from. Um, I believe it is publicly accessible to get the list uh, there. Um, so, so I don't know exactly how you how you request that from the state though. Oh, uh, signatures. Um, so uh, yeah, signatures are, are, are a terrible security mechanism and always have been. Uh, but yeah, especially now that we, we're trying to sign on touch screens that don't record signatures very well. I think all of us have given up trying to write a legible signature on those things, uh, which is one of the bad things, I guess, about the electronic poll books. Uh, some of those do accept your signature digital, um, uh, digitally on a touch screen. Um, so yeah, it's not the strongest security me me mechanism. Um, in many ways, some, some of the strongest security mechanisms is just the locality of the precincts and that people tend to act as poll workers for a long time. They know their neighborhoods, they recognize people there. Um, but yeah, we, we probably should move to a more modern thing as opposed to using signatures on, on anything any longer. Um. You, um, you know, made it clear that we can't really expect to have uh, secure voting, electronic voting, and that paper is the, the way to, to check. But I wonder if you look into the future, will that always be so, or um, is there, will there come a point in time where the technology allows us to, to vote uh, simply from home uh, electronically, uh, or is that just overly optimistic? Um, unfortunately, seeing, seeing what companies are willing to, to invest in, in secure software today, yeah, I really don't see that happening in my lifetime, at least. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, making, you know, software that you can mathematically prove is correct is really hard. And of course, all of the electronic uh, voting manufacturers are, are completely against this idea. They don't have the capacity to uh, do that. Um, themselves, and they certainly don't want to see it being required, which would create, you know, new, new competitors from places like the people who do aircraft software and the like. Well, let's give James a round of applause to your audience. And you great okay. places with you yeah. uh, real quick. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, I'm not too frightened, James. Uh, uh, I do want to remind everybody, uh, yesterday was National Voter Registration uh, Day. That's uh, part of why we scheduled uh, this lecture for the kickoff. So if you have not registered to vote, uh, please do. And I think we can fairly say that uh, you can register online and that's reasonably secure. You just can't vote that way. Uh, so uh, if you go to your Secretary of State's uh, website, you will be able to do that. The deadline to register in our region, Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana is October the 11th. So if you want to vote in the midterm elections in November uh, and you're not registered, please do so by October the 11th. Uh, I remind you that our season uh, for 2022 and 2023 is now available at 6 at 6nkuedu So have a look. And our next uh, topic up is um, uh, our next lecture is October the 19th, and the topic is A Short History of Distance, A Human Story of Time, Space, Power, and Privilege by Dr. Jonathan Reynolds of the NKU History and Geography Department. So hope you can join us uh, then. And I want to say a special thanks to the studio audience uh, and remind people that when you register, you can come. And it's kind of fun to be here, right, uh, and uh, uh, watch the production. And a uh, special thank you also we have students with us tonight from Norse Media. They are students who are uh, being educated to uh, be professionals in this uh, field of video production and increasingly uh, web production. Part of the reason that we do the series is uh, uh, because it uh, provides an educational opportunity uh, for our students uh, to be involved in things that uh, uh, will be their profession. And when COVID came along and we had to go uh, from in-person talks to uh, Virtual Talks, North Media joined us as a partner. It's been fantastic. Uh, I've, uh, if you've been on uh, 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 the Six at Six uh, 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 talks before, you may have heard me say this, but when we first started, 
we called some video production companies to get help and they said we really don't know how to do all the web and zoom uh, production yet it's something new uh, so we're going to graduate students with skills in that and so thank you team for uh, all the production tonight we uh, greatly appreciate it uh, if you have any uh, feedback you'd like to give us or suggestions for topics uh, engage at nku.edu is our email address uh, thanks for being with us and we'll see you on October the 19th.